Frank Ryan Champion, the political science and world politics librarian and coordinator of the House of Learning Lectures. We welcome students, colleagues, faculty, and invited guests here today to hear Professor Terry Olson from the Department of Marriage, Family, and Human Development deliver today's House of Learning lecture entitled, Redeeming the Past, Our Power in the Present Moment. The library sponsors two main lectures and lecture series, the House of Learning Lectures and the Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture. Through these lectures, the library brings together scholars and students to engage in a civil discussion of ideas, and in so doing, the library contributes to building a learned community which fosters the faithful life of the mind. The House of Learning Lectures series title is taken from the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 119, where the Lord instructs the saints to prepare every needful thing, even a house of learning. Because the library is the campus repository for the literature of all academic disciplines and scholarship, the library is well positioned to be considered BYU's house of learning. The Harold B. Lee Library takes seriously its campus role as the intellectual heart of inquiry and knowledge and is honored to provide this House of Learning lecture today. Now about today's lecturer. Professor Terry Olson earned a bachelor's degree from BYU in 1967 and a master's degree in family relationships at BYU in 1969. In 1973, while he was an assistant professor of marriage and family at the University of New Mexico, he completed a PhD in family counseling and personality at Florida State University, whereupon he returned to BYU in 1974. A prolific scholar, he has authored dozens of articles on families, sexuality, relationships, and adolescent development, including a chapter entitled Fathering and the Moral Development of Children in Brotherson and White's 2007 book, Why Fathers Count. He has written widely and is an authority on the subjects of interpersonal relationships and faith. Among his many writings, he has authored significant entries in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism and has contributed scholarly assessments of the Proclamation on the Family. In addition to his epistolary contributions, he has served as chair of his department and as an associate dean, as well as providing extensive service in the church. Without doubt, he is a model of faithful academic mentorship to his students. It gives great pleasure to welcome today's House of Learning lecturer, Professor Terry Olson. I'm grateful you were willing to come, and um, we're, we're considering two main possibilities. You, you've got an outline that should help a wee bit. Uh, the outline is primarily to keep me on track and to help you remember what you otherwise would have forgotten uh, after you leave. But the two main possibilities that we're considering are first, how we typically explain ourselves, that is, our human being. How we typically explain ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, our attitudes, may not always allow us to tell the whole truth about what it means to be human. Just consider that possibility. Secondly, our explanations of ourselves often invoke an assumption that we are somehow trapped by or even victims of the past. We're proposing that it is possible in the present moment to redeem the past, even change it in the most meaningful way that we can change the past, and hence the title, Redeeming the Past, Our Power in the Present Moment. I suppose I need to talk a little bit about what it means to redeem the past. The first notion is that we can extricate ourselves from being victims of it. How often have you tried to explain your behavior by noting that if such and such hadn't happened to you, you wouldn't think, feel, or act today the way you think, feel, and act? Now, the past is significant in terms of who we are in the present moment, but it may not be that we are victims of it as we often explain ourselves. The second definition of redeeming the past for today is to find that the meaning in our lives comes from what we are in the present moment. Uh, often I think our culture assumes that the present moment is hostage to the past. That is what happened in our yesterdays irrevocably and inescapably 
uh, creates something about who we are in the present moment that, that we can do nothing about. That whole notion doesn't bode well for the notion of agency. So in terms of what we are, we're proposing that perhaps humans are not merely victims of past events. And perhaps the past is meaningful, but not dictatorial of our present attitudes and emotions. I will give examples of that in just a moment. And finally, perhaps it is possible to meet the challenges of life when we live whole in the present moment. And that's a term also that I've got to, to explain, I, I'm sure. First proposal is we help create the quality of the present moment. Here's an example of what I mean by that. Uh, this is a classic case from the Arbinger group, a group with whom uh, I have studied for 30 years, amazingly enough. <clears throat> the example is a man who hops in the car to go down to the 7-Eleven to get bread and milk. And uh, on his way back from having done so, as he pulls the car in the garage, he realizes that the gas gauge on the tank is bumping, or bumping on empty. He knows that his wife will need the car the next morning to go to a dental appointment that's 45 minutes down the road. And he has a very human feeling come to him as he sees that needle bouncing on empty. The human feeling he has is, you know, I ought to go and fill this up so it's ready for her in the morning. Uh, all she needs is to run out of gas on the freeway halfway to her appointment. That feeling seemingly was more fleeting than it ought to be. Because in the next instant, in the next moment, if you will, the quality of his thoughts change dramatically. All of a sudden, he's saying things to himself with great emotion like this. <laughs> How many times have I told her to always drive on the top half of the tank? She's going to come out here in the morning, and she's going to run out of gas. And, and you know what? I almost, I almost lot to let her run out of gasoline just to teach her a lesson. I'm sure that would go over big, right? But these are what's going through his mind. Uh, not the least of which is one other little comment, which is, you know, she could have said something to me, and, and you know, I wish I'd noticed this when I went down there. Now I've got to make a second trip. And so you begin to see a certain spirit with which he is reflecting on this urgency of a matter in the present moment. He has one quality of feeling and thought when he first sees the gas gauge, and then something goes on to where the very meaning of seeing the gas gauge is transformed, and uh, he no longer is entertaining the idea of doing what he originally felt might be the thing to do. Well, this is my quick attempt to illustrate that there are two worlds or qualities of experience available to us in every moment. Uh, that is, uh, we, we are not determined by what happened yesterday in the quality of how we respond to an empty gas gauge, all right? The quality of present experience is grounded in our moral way of being in the present moment. Now, I want to claim that this husband's feelings to go fill up the gas tank were not merely some kind of symptom or artifact of him having knowledge about gasoline and automobiles, uh, I don't even think it's a matter of his ability to back the car out of the garage and get back down to where a gasoline pump is. What's most fundamental about the thought that he has about going to fill up the gas tank is it's a moral call, a moral feeling. He has the moral sensitivity to see a possibility and the wherewithal as a human being in the present moment to act on it. So, in any given moment, there are two ways we have of being. We can take offense at circumstances in our lives which is what he was doing with the second quality of feelings I described. Or we can give our best, John, just back the car out and go down and do what you sense, you know. We can give our best in any given circumstance. When we take offense at life, to make it generic here, the quality of our lives changes. That quality changes because of who we are and not because of what the circumstance is. So our starting point for quality living, I'm going to claim, begins in what we are, and I'm going to claim that is in the present moment. Here's a long, another long time old example from my own experience. Once upon a time, I was watching an NCAA playoff game. Those of you who know me well know that uh, while I have few addictions in life, the NCAA basketball tournament may very well be one of them. And it was an evening where my wife was off to a meeting and the little ones were in bed, and I, I had these thoughts such as, ha, 
an uninterrupted evening and an NCAA playoff game. Can life get better than this? All right. uh, my teenage daughter, who was upstairs doing homework, uh, came down the stairs, and I tensed a wee bit. She came around the corner, walked in, and I knew immediately what was going to happen. And the words that came out of her mouth fulfilled uh, the prophetic note that I had in my own soul, which were, Dad, I don't get this math problem. Now, I, like John the gasoline filler-upper, or would-be gasoline filler-upper, had a feeling come to me, a very moral feeling, very human feeling, right? And that feeling was, help your daughter with her math. Simple feeling. Uh, this is not a story where I honored that feeling, at least not at first. No, what I, in fact, did was begin to question her. Um, perhaps in, uh, become an inquisitor would be a better term. Kathy, have you tried have you tried the sample problems like this one in the book? Well, well, no, Dad. I had, well, are, you expect me to do the work for you without you. Do, if you don't do your part, how can I do my? And so, well, by the time I'm finished with her, she has a lower lip problem, and that lower lip problem is where it's protruding, you know, and it's kind of okay. Never mind. I'll, I'll just go try it myself. So she stalks out. Notice she doesn't walk out. And I turned my attention back to the game, the all-important game. I remember at this point that there were two minutes and eight seconds left to halftime. I turned my attention back to the game, but I've got to tell you that while my eyes were on the screen, everything else about me was somewhere else. I was now doing what I like to call muttering in my mind. I was saying things to myself about my daughter the way John was saying things to himself about his wife, not filling up the, the car in the, uh, with gasoline as she should. So I was saying things like, teenagers are always trying to shift responsibility for what they have to do to somebody else. Well, I'm not going to be that indulgent, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the problem with all that. Remember that my moral feeling was I ought to help her with her math. There's a good ending to that story. Uh, we may not have time to tell it, so uh, you'll just get half a story today, perhaps. But what's our starting point in redeeming the past? Well, in any given moment, any given present moment, we can live true or false, soft or hard, compassionately or resentfully. Those are the available qualities of thoughts and feelings that come to us in any moment, in any situation. We can find life as inherently a blessing or inherently a burden. In It's a Wonderful Life, you'll remember the classic illustration of seeing life itself as a burden resulted in George Bailey uh, going through an existence as if he had never existed. So those two possibilities are available to us to see life as inherently a blessing or as inherently a burden. The starting point for living in a way that we can change the past is in the present moment, not in the past. If we're really trapped by what life is like in our yesterdays, in, in our back then, in terms of quality anyway, then how can the present moment be anything other than just a product, just an outcome? The most simplest and maybe cliched example of what I'm getting at is how do we see human being? Are we really billiard balls on the table of life just being acted upon by a cue ball? Is that all we are? And if that's all we are, then we have nothing to say, frankly, about our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our attitudes, our decisions. We are all just products of something that went before. But you say, well, the past has to have some meaning. I mean, after all, the past is rich. After all, Gordon B. Hinckley told us that we all ought to be in touch with our heritage. Absolutely. And so here's the proposal. Is the way we're living in the present moment one that appreciates the possibilities and blessings from our heritage and history and past events? Do we sorrow over those injustices and discriminatory events that, uh, that were more than unfair. Uh, is, is there a way to see all those things in the present moment that we are not trapped or victimized by them? Now, I'm going to use an example of fear today because fear uh, in our vernacular and sometimes in our experience 
is that we can experience fear and feel absolutely immobilized. We're so afraid we can't seem to do anything. We are paralyzed in the present moment. Does that make sense? Yet, it is possible that our moral sensibilities are more fundamental than our fears. And that's something I'm going to carry through and, and see if I can make a case for that. Uh, doing right by others, John picking up the, uh, going and filling the car with gasoline, Terry uh, repenting of his uh, lust for NCAA basketball long enough to go upstairs and, and help his daughter. Uh, that, that's what I mean by doing right by others in the present moment transforms the quality of our lives. In the story I told you about my refusal to help my daughter with her math when I believe that I should, uh, my, her having come into the room was a burden. Her having made the request was a pain in the neck. Her having interrupted the game was a disaster. If, if I had known how to sing uh, the song Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me, maybe I would have, you know. It was that much of a, a, a qualitative disaster for me. But guess what? At some point, um, I, I gave up on the game. And it was because, uh, I don't know what happens to you, but what happens to me is I, I, you, you don't escape a moral feeling you have. You only resist it and, and tell yourself things that excuse you in trying to do the thing, or not do the thing that you believe is right. So I remember giving it up. And, and by the way, I wasn't doing this just behaviorally. What, we, what we'll discover today is that the meaning of behavior is deeper than the behavior itself. All right. So I wasn't just going through the motions. I did not go upstairs as irritated that I had to do it as I was irritated with the initial request. No, no, my heart had changed. Got up to where she was working feverishly, opened the half-open door a little bit more, and I said, uh, hey, Kathy, and she said, what? I said, how, how, how are you doing? Fine. Did you, get that, did you get that problem solved? No, no, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. I'm going to do it uh, with the teacher tomorrow at school. Okay, well, what have you done? Well, I've gone on inside. I've gone ahead. Well, show me where that problem was. So she's working out of the book here, and I have to go around and go back a few pages and look at the problem she was going to ask me about, and we have this conversation, and I ask her a question. Ooh, you know, I've forgotten more about quadratic equation factoring than I, than I used to know, but tell me this. What step do you take first? Do you do this or do you that? And, and still in her sort of hard, impudent way, which I had helped provoke, right, says, well, I'm not sure, but I think you, and I think you, and then I said, well, how about this? And she said, oh, yeah, and anyway, at the end of five or six minutes, we solved the problem, did the one, checked the answer, did some other sample problems, uh, all was copacetic, you know. Uh, so I said, okay, do you think you need any more help? No, 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 Dad, I've, I've got the rest of it done. So as I was leaving the room, she turns to me and says, hey, Dad, what? Thanks, Dad. Hey, thank you, Kathy, I was the one that kind of mucked it up down there. Again, end of story. The story did not have to end that way, did it? I could have either stayed downstairs and insisting that my basketball game was more important than my moral feeling to help, or I could have gone upstairs in this self-righteous, demanding, almost dictatorial reminder of her that she is an irresponsible math studier and make it worse. But that was a story with the, where the present moment changed the past just a bit, to say it another way. By the time I had gotten upstairs to seek a way to solve the problem, the meaning of who I was and what I had done downstairs had become clear to me, and I wasn't the same person now in trying to help her as I had been when she made the initial request. I'm going to claim that it's similar, uh, similar situation for us in the case of fear. We can be fearful and experience fear of a certain quality, and then in the way we change our hearts, the quality of that fear can change. Sometimes that means we are free of fear altogether. Remember when you were younger and you were afraid of the dark, dark walking from the garage into the house. And then at some point in time, uh, the dark, quote, held no more fear for you. Not because the dark had changed, but because you had changed. When fearful, we may not be able to create the outcome we wish, but we can nevertheless give our best in the situation. All right? Now. We're going to use a film clip from Apollo 13 to illustrate what I'm getting at in here in terms of fear. The first clip we're going to see 
is going to be of Marilyn Lovell, Jim Lovell, the astro astronaut's wife, who is, is worried mightily about this third launch, this third trip into space that her husband is going to make. In fact, uh, Jim Lovell had made the mistake the week before the launch of taking his wife, Marilyn, to a movie that I believe the title of uh, was Marooned. It was about some astronauts who got marooned on another planet. Well, that's not where you take your wife, who was already nervous and worried about a launch a week before the launch. But that was part of the deal. Now, in this, in this film clip, I want you to focus primarily on Marilyn Lovell's fear. Now, now what you're going to first see is, uh, frankly, her nightmare. And, and uh, so just re understand that what you're seeing is a nightmare at first. And then we go to astronaut Jim Lovell, totally excited that he's going to be the, commanding, the command pilot for this uh, launch, talking to his little boy about it. And there's a point, at and, and uh, Marilyn comes down to eavesdrop. So, so the two things are going to develop in this scene. There's Marilyn's fear, coupled with an admiration of her husband's uh, engagement with her son. And then there's also the little boy's fear. Uh, I want you to notice in, in uh, this scene, she'll experience both qualities of fear, although not simultaneously. Just as in one moment, John felt that he ought to fill up the gas tank and was fully prepared to go act on his moral feeling uh, honestly and yield to it. But in the next moment, he seemed to be resisting, or in Terry Warner's words, betraying that feeling and, and whining and complaining and murmuring about how obnoxious his wife's lack of filling up the gas tank behavior really was for him, all right? Well, similarly, there's a kind of fear that is paralyzing and, and makes us feel completely overwhelmed um, versus a kind of fear that we move through, carry with, but take an action that is also morally more fundamental than the fear itself. Um, so she'll experience both qualities of fear. I'm going to let the clip run to an exchange between Marilyn and Jim in the Corvette. And, and what Marilyn is doing, and what's going on here, by the way, is uh, she's afraid, she feels overwhelmed, she feels like she can't handle it, and, and Jim Lovell doesn't have a clue, all right? So what Marilyn starts to do is give a bunch of excuses. Notice I'm telling you how to see this. I want you to know what to look for, okay? And so, so uh, Marilyn begins her sets of excuses, and, and you watch what goes on with Lovell. Then, after she lays the bombshell on the table, I want you to watch what Lovell does, what Jim Lovell does, okay? Uh, before the scene is over, uh, you'll be able to notice when Jim Lovell gets it, that is, when he recognizes she is afraid, and then you'll notice when Marilyn Lovell gets it, when she recognizes his disappointment in her not coming to the launch. Now, there are two different emotions, fear, disappointment. Uh, you'll, want us, uh, you'll notice how it's not made explicit by either one of them. Marilyn Lovell never says outright to her husband, I'm afraid but she gives all kinds of evidence that you and Jim Lovell get the point, you know, figure it out. Um, Jim Lovell does not say, boy, I'm really disappointed and I love you, honey, and I wish you were there. He, uh, but she gets it. All right, let's see if uh, this is going to work in the manner that we are all praying it will. <laughs> Take you to get to the moon. Four days. But that's pretty fast. See, this is the Saturn four B booster, and it shoots us away from the Earth as fast as a bullet from a gun. And so the moon's gravity actually 
badges and pulls us into a circle around the moon. It's called an orbit. All right. Fred and I float down the tunnel into this guy, the lunar module, the spidery looking guy. Only holds two people, and it's just for landing on the moon. And I take the controls, and I steer it around, and I fly it down, adjusting it here, the attitude there, pitch, roll, for a nice, soft landing on the moon. Better than your launch. Way better than Pecan. Did you need to ask to not to the fire? Yeah, yeah, I did. I need the astronauts in the fire. All of them. Did that happen again? Well, I'll tell you something about the fire. Um, a lot of things went wrong. The, uh, the door. It's called a hatch. They couldn't get it open when they needed to get out. That was one thing. And, uh... No, a lot of things went wrong with that fire. Did they fix it? Oh, yes, absolutely. We fixed it. It's not a problem anymore. I can't believe they still have you doing public appearances. Yeah. Henry Hart was... these kids for a while now. They've never kept you from coming to the other one. Yes, but now we have your mother. She's just had this oh, stroke. Oh, mom's fine. Honey, it's not like I've never been to a launch before. The other wives have not done three. Just, I just don't think I can go through all that. Let's just be glad when this one's over. Well, you're gonna miss a hell of a show. She sees his blinking and blinking and blinking. I'm going to claim that in the moment that Jim Lovell realized his wife was afraid, and that was the real issue, that the meaning of the past for him changed. And it didn't change because the past changed. Marilyn's fear from the past week and months was still something they could recall. But it changed because now he understood something that he had been unwilling to see. And when in the present moment we see honestly the situation, other people, ourselves, we see the past anew. It is no longer a burden, but a tool of, of uh, informing us, teaching us, unfolding the world to us. We always claim that we came here for purpose of learning. My experience has been that when we see life as inherently a burden, we don't learn anything from the past that we are supposed to learn. But when we are living whole in the present moment, honoring our moral feelings, then the past informs very, very well who we are, what we can do, how we can think, feel, and act. So Jim Lovell sees his wife's fear and lets go of his attempt to dissuade her from coming to the launch. She glances over after dropping the bombshell. Uh, people who are going against a moral feeling they have, which in her case might be either uh, to support her husband or demonstrate uh, that it means something to her to be uh, with him in this great event, 
whatever the, the moral sensibility, when she sees all that blinking from her husband, she, uh, the past changes for her. Uh, her fear has not disappeared, but it has changed in quality, and her moral sensitivity about her own role and her, and her husband's situation uh, has changed as well. Um, Marilyn responds to her husband's faith, to his philosophy, to his approach to life in a film clip I'm about to show. Turns and get sick in outer space, right? Hey, boys. You're not giving your mom a hard time, are you? Princess, you look beautiful. Hey, that looks like Marilyn Lovell. But it can't be. She's not coming to the launch. I heard it was going to be a hell of a show. Well, who told you that? Some guy I know. <laughs> you can't live without me. Okay, folks. Let's say good night. We got a big day tomorrow for these guys. Good night. You hear about Ken? Yeah. Um, a little background. One of the uh, news anchors in the 70s was a fellow named Jules Bergman. There's a couple of you here who I suspect, without being offensive to you, will have remembered <laughs> Jules Bergman. I am one of them. I remember Jules Bergman in the 70s. Marilyn Lovell carried a fury against Bergman because all he ever wanted to talk about was what went wrong? When were you afraid? What other disasters have you faced? He was just Mr. Pessimism, you know, he got the world title for that in, in uh, Marilyn Lovell's mind. And, and during the filming of Apollo 13, Jim Lovell told a story to Tom Hanks about being over the Sea of Japan and having the lights in his cockpit short out. And when Hanks heard the story, he said, we've got to get that in the movie somehow. And what's uh, tremendous about the way they put it in the movie uh, was that uh, it was a comfort, they, they used it in the movie as a comfort for Marilyn. Uh, here her, here's her husband in harm's way outside the Earth's atmosphere, and she has a chance to see her husband respond to one of those negative, in her mind, questions from Jules Bergman about being an astronaut, about being a jet pilot, about all the things that put him in harm's way. Um, in this clip, by the way, when, when Marilyn Lovell watched uh, the actress playing her on, on television, she said at this point and then another point where she was very, where, they, where the actress was very afraid, uh, Marilyn found herself blurting out, boy, I can really identify with that woman, <laughs> the one that's representing me. So let's see uh, how this goes. Apollo 13 Commander Jim Lovell has more time in space, almost 24 days already, than any other man. And I asked him recently if he ever was scared. Oh, well, I've had an engine flame out a few times in an aircraft, and was kind of curious as to whether it was going to light up again, things of that nature. But uh, they, they, they seem to work out. Is there a specific instance in an airplane emergency when you can recall fear? Uh, well, I tell you, I remember this one time, I'm, uh, I'm in a banshee at night in combat condition, so there's no running lights on the carrier. Uh, it was a Shangri-La, we were in the Sea of Japan, and my, my radar had jammed, and my homing signal was gone because somebody in Japan was actually using the same frequency, and so it was, it was leading me away from where I was supposed to be. And I'm looking down at a big black ocean, so uh, I flip on my map light, and then suddenly, zap, everything shorts out right there in my cockpit. All my instruments are gone, my lights are gone, and I can't even tell now what my altitude is. 
I know I'm running out of fuel, so I'm thinking about uh, about ditching in the ocean. And I I look down there, and then in in the darkness, there's this uh, there's this green trail. It's like a long carpet that just laid out right beneath me, and it was the algae, right? It was that phosphorescent stuff that gets churned up in the wake of a big ship, and it was it was it was just leading me home. And now, if my cockpit lights hadn't shorted out, there's no way I'd have ever been able to see that. So. You, uh, you never know what, what events are going to transpire to get you home. Okay, spacecraft commander Jim Lovell, no stranger to emergency is he. It, it really cracks me up regarding uh, Bergman's response because when, when you think about it, uh, Tom Hanks dash Jim Lovell's story was a story of faith, hope, and a philosophy that you, you give your best in every moment. And, and Bergman doesn't know how to handle it, right? There's that silence, and then there's that, okay. Uh, it, it, it reminds me, by the way, just a little footnote here. It reminds me of, of the man who founded the Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When he was 16 years old, he was almost lynched by a mob in a little small town in Indiana. The mob had already lynched two teenagers and had the rope around his neck and we're dragging him down the center of the street. And uh, the man said that he prayed, asked to have his sins forgiven him, and then prayed that the Lord would not let these men do this thing. And in the next moment, he heard a voice that said, don't do this thing. A calm came over the mob. The people holding the rope dropped it. They drifted off. The fellow got up and ran out of there, got out of there. And later, a PBS interviewer, in asking the man about this incident, said, um, when, when you tell people that you heard a voice, uh, how do you explain that to them? And, and I don't know if this comment from him was original with him, but it's a classic that I've never forgotten. He said, well, to those people who believe, no explanation is necessary. And to those people who do not believe, no explanation is possible. Ah. To Jim Lovell, who, who explained a philosophy of hope and, and never give up, with, with, the, with the concluding notion that you never know what's going to transpire to get you home, Bergman's response is, okay then after a pause. Well, all right. Now I'm going to claim one more thing about Marilyn Lovell being able to change the past. Uh, we've seen incidents where it looked as if, to her especially, and maybe to us, as if life was overwhelming. The fears that she was confronting were more than any human could be expected to bear. Hence, I can't possibly go to a launch, for example, because the other wives haven't had to do three going to a launch as a burden, right? Um, she does not, um, however, uh, have that quality of fear carry with her across time. And one of my points today is that our, our moral sensitivities to one another are more fundamental than our fears. And because of that, it's possible for the quality of our cheer, fear to change sufficiently to allow the moral feelings we have to be more fundamental. This clip is going to be of uh, Marilyn and the little boy, Jeff. You'll need to recall what Lovell is saying to the little boy. And uh, by the way, the most important line uh, in that exchange between Lovell and his little boy who was asking about the fire and the accident was the pronoun that Jim Lovell used in response to his little boy's question, did they fix it? I believe the smile on the little boy's face was because Jim Lovell's answer was not, yeah, they fixed it. Jim Lovell's answer was, oh yeah, we fixed it. Little boy has faith in his father. If his father was one of the we's that fixed it, maybe things are gonna be okay. All right, so we're gonna watch Marilyn uh, respond to a moral call to Jeff. I'm going to claim she tells the truth. She gives her best, but her concern or fear is still obvious. Okay. And then 
Jeff draws upon the only knowledge he has from his dad in his little seven-year-old mind. It's only by a very narrow margin that we're going to get Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert back alive. Very? Very close. Not so much delineated by the word. I'm sorry, Jeffrey's calling. But I think by the terseness of Trav and the grim lines of Jim McGivitt. This has been a very close call, and we're not out of the woods yet. Not by a long shot. Jeffrey? Why are so many people here? Oh, Dave. You know, he's your dad's flying his mission. He said he was going to get me a new knock. Dad. Something broke in your daddy's spaceship. And he's going to have to turn around before he even gets to the moon. Jeff, we go away. So we have a little boy's fear, not able to put together all of the, all of the things that an adult would put together to make sense out of the danger. But the quality of Marilyn's fear does not keep her from giving her best to the boy, all right? Now, what about this idea then that the present moment is not hostage to the past? I tried to use an example of emotion to show that, that our, our helplessness and sense of being overwhelmed need not be something that we are trapped by or that we cannot escape from. And that the solution to those kinds of problems comes in the present moment and is not grounded in the past. So let's see if the implications of this idea are worth the time you've spent to hear it. Uh, so what about all this stuff, all right? Well, the present moment is not hostage to the past. When we live true to our moral sense to give our best, and usually that means giving our best to others and giving our best to what we believe uh, would help us do right by them, we are open to our felt call to help others. We draw upon the past for knowledge, understanding, strength, and direction. Precisely because life is no longer a burden to us, the past is meaningful in a way that we can draw upon to make a difference in the present moment. Some additional so what's. When we resist our moral sense, the present moment does become a burden to us, and we feel helpless, trapped, and on occasion even overwhelmed. I think we've seen both those qualities in these clips. In such moments, it looks to us as if the present moment has been ruined by the past. We've used some fairly dramatic events to illustrate that, but I believe it holds true on the little everyday events that I suggested. For example, what does John do, uh, the, the gasoline filler upper, what does he do when he refuses to act on his moral call to go do it? He invokes the past. How many times have I told her that she needs to drive on the top half of the tank? So he's going to use that to justify either why uh, it's not going to be the right thing to go do what he felt was right uh, a millisecond ago, and he's going to use that also as proof that if his wife were uh, not such a space cadet on gasoline, that, that he wouldn't have to worry about this anyway. In such moments, it looks to us if the present moment has been ruined by the past. We then, in that moment, do not see ourselves as agents, but as victims. Think of the last time that you felt you ought to take an action on behalf of somebody, but perhaps it's someone against whom you've been holding a grudge. You will not do the thing that you feel you ought to do. And what you'll tell yourself is, because of what Beulah did to me in the past, I'm not going to do this now. How, oh, what a perfect way to make yourself hostage to the past in the present moment and simultaneously shift responsibility from what you believe would be right to do onto somebody else's shoulders. Uh, the final so what. While in the past, excuse me, while the past is relevant to who we are, obviously, I hope we've made that case as well, it is the quality of life we're living in the present moment that determines what knowledge and in what spirit we bring forward past memories. If you bring forward uh, grudges and injustices in a burdensome way, then you'll be burdened in the present moment. If you remember injustices as, as a sobering reminder that, that the world can have 
uh, dastardly and discriminatory and, and evil uh, forces in it, and that yet in the present moment you have the ability not to be that way yourself, you still have a better starting point than if you are burdened by all those past things that have come up. When we live true in the present moment then, we genuinely learn from the past the very things we are supposed to learn. And in present moments of living true, that is doing right by others as we see it, honoring our moral call, our moral promptings, being true to conscience, however you want to say it, we really do redeem the past because we're no longer living as if it were a burden. I don't know if anybody's ever really tried to measure the percentage of events in their past that were beneficial or fair or just or compassionate or cheerful, cheerful thrifty, brave, clean, or reverent. I don't know if we've ever really measured the percentage of that compared to the percentage of times when we've been done unto, when injustice has prevailed. But it evidently doesn't matter what the percentage of the past is that's been that way. What always matters is who we are in the present moment. In present moments of living true, we redeem the past because we are no longer living as if it were a burden. And finally, even in the face of injustice, disappointment, or betrayal by others, we can sorrow rather than despair. I believe sorrow is a celestial term. I believe sorrow is a, a synonym for godly sorrow, if you will. So we can sorrow rather than despair, which is giving up, finding the burdens overwhelming, right? The difference, however, in this is in what we are, not in what the circumstance is. Appreciate you coming, and I hope this is more meaningful next Wednesday than it is today, when in some real-life situation, you're confronted with the opportunity to uh, essentially do right, as you, your conscience suggests, rather than be burdened by an opportunity in the present moment to do the right thing. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you.